Yo, cool, cool. Where are you going? Yeah, I'm going to be quiet this today. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I, I have never been accused of being quiet, so I'll just say that. And, but I can only stay for an hour or so. <laughs> cool. No worries. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Yeah. Um, let me just see where my people are. One second. It's uh, with great delight that Angela is hosting the room today. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is wonderful. So. Angela, uh, I, lo I love all the books that are behind you. That's very cool oh, looking. Thank you. My, my, my grandfather's books, my grandfather's oh. encyclopedias. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, you never see actual real physical encyclopedias anymore. Right? <laughs> um, so I'm, Wikipedia. I'm really lucky to have them. Wikipedia just doesn't look so cool in the background. It just doesn't look so cool. <laughs> Um, uh, I'd love to introduce myself, uh, but please, anyone who's here for the first time, uh, anyone who has their mic on, please go right ahead and give yourself a short introduction, your name, and how you found Project Catalyst. I, I can start. Um, so I'm Alison Fromm. I'm attending the Eastern Town Hall more or less for the first time, um, but I've been around Project Catalyst for a long time, um, and most recently I'm very humbled and honored to have been selected for the Catalyst Circle representing the general ADA voters, which is kind of a broad category and includes everyone and anyone. Um, and one of the things that's really important to me in that role as representing the general ADA holders is bringing in voices from all over the world um, and perhaps people who aren't participating as actively in Catalyst for one reason or another, whether it's language or time zone or um, lack of knowledge or lack of time. So um, just really wanted to make as many connections as possible to a, as broad a representative of Catalyst voices or general ADA voices as possible and hear what's going on in the community and um, what, if anything, I can do to um, encourage engagement and participation, particularly when it comes to voting. Um, I should also say that I am American, but I live in Zug, Switzerland, which is the Crypto Valley. And I am really excited to say that I've actually just quit my day job to focus 100% of my efforts on Cardano and Catalyst. So that is it for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for introducing yourself, Alison. It's a pleasure to meet you. I've seen you in the Western town here. Um, <laughs> have you in the Eastern Town Hall. Um, Thank you. Who else would like to introduce themselves? Jeremy. Go next. Hi. Yeah, hi. How are you? Hi, so, uh, sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Furster. I'm head of partnerships and executive officer at Cardano Foundation. I'm based in Taiwan. So this is my first time live participating in any Catalyst event. I've watched a lot on, on YouTube and I, I know a lot of your faces and names and I've met a few of you previously. So uh, yeah, it's great to be here and participate uh, with you guys here. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Who else would like to introduce themselves? Um, I'll go. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm based in Tel Aviv in Israel, and um, yeah, just brand new to the community. I just joined the Discord yesterday, actually, and then when I woke up this morning, I saw there was a meeting, so I was like, okay, I'll just hop in. Um, and really excited to be here and, and learn from everyone. So thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Anyone else? I'll go next. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Evans Kisanga. I'm from Tanzania. Um, 
I was invited by Angela to attend this uh, Eastern Town Hall meeting. I've uh, been following up on Cardano so much lately, uh, and I'm happy to be here so that I can connect, learn from you as well. Thank you so much. I might try um, then. I'll go uh, next. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Martin. I'm from Kenya. Um, I've known Angela for a while, and um, yeah, I'm just excited to be here. Uh, I'm a fruit exporter, and I'm trying to figure out how I can improve the lives of the farmers and and the workers all around. So, thanks for inviting me, guys. Cool. I'll just thanks uh, for coming in, Robert. Yeah. Yeah, I'll put my hand up. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I'm Robert O'Brien. I'm coming in from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And normally I'm the primary host of this, this room, but tonight it's Angela's job, which I'm so absolutely so delighted about because I don't have to talk too much. <laughs> no, because Angela will do a fantastic job. And it's lovely to see everyone here from uh, across the, uh, Eastern Africa. It's really, really nice. Who's next? Hi, everyone. Hi, Tim. Uh, this is Joseph from Kenya. Hi. So uh, I'm new to everything. <laughs> I'm trying to learn. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I, I, I'm basically based in Nairobi, uh, doing edu education technology, just trying to see how uh, I can learn with you guys. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us, Joseph. Would anyone else like Hi, to go? Hi, everyone. I'm Anne. Um, yeah, I invited Joseph, and I'm Angela's mom. Um, Angela invited me. So, um, yeah, it's good to be here again. Joseph and I has, have worked a lot on education and technology in uh, marginalized areas and we are very interested in reaching unreached or hard to reach or difficult to reach people because we believe that the ones who benefit the most from such an opportunity even if it's a little help whatever little help we can give them will make a big big difference in their lives so we do work in uh, marginalized areas and areas where people are struggling to just make ends meet or to just live and who have difficulties with livelihoods. So our the desire is to reach the children, their handlers who are the teachers, children in school, teachers, and um, anybody who supports uh, vulnerable people. So that's my desire and my goal to be here. Thank you, mom. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Been such hard work getting her here, but she's here now. I'm so happy. <laughs> I, I, I would like to point out the last, the last town hall we had, my son was also in the room. So it was quite literally a family affair <laughs> with, yeah, Ange <laughs> with Angela and Anne. Uh, my son is currently busy playing Halo. Uh, he's decided that that's <laughs> But so Alison is saying she's going to ask her mother to join. Yes, please. Let's, let's make it family yeah, affair. Absolutely. Yeah, because then there's more support when you're in a family. You know, it's uh, easier. Uh, absolutely. Well, Mr. Appreciate... Tafera, I would absolutely, absolutely love to hear from you after Simon. Yeah. yeah. All right. After Simon. Oh, Stephen, not Simon, but, the, but you oh, both I'm so Steve. sorry. I'm so yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I got confused. <laughs> Stephen, fine, I'm sorry. Fine. You go first. It's fine. All right. Um, my, again, my father, actually, in Ethiopia, we don't have family name. So we have our own name and we put our father's name behind. So I am taking actually. Um, I live in Sweden. And I was with uh, Cardano for a long time, from uh, with Catholics from Fund One, but I was a lurker, as uh, uh, they are saying, um, because I was working a lot, so I couldn't find a lot of time. But uh, lastly, I was 
I had a little problem with my shoulder, so I wasn't going to work. So I started attending much more. So I'm here now. Thanks for being here again. Stephen. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, I'm Stephen. Um, Stephen Witt is still. I've been involved in Qatar and Project Catalyst in particular since March of this year, particularly with an organization called Quality Assurance Dow. And I do a lot of documentation and auditing type issues. Uh, I'm involved in Swarm and also organizing the ECN Town Hall. And most recently, I'm a colleague of Alison with uh, Capitalist Circle version two. Uh, and I represent the funding cohort, which is called the Capitalist Coordinator. So if anyone here has a, a funded proposal, um, I'd like to reach, you know, hear your views on the proposal process uh, for Project Catalyst. And um, but I'm primarily here to listen and to see all these wonderful new, new faces and to hear people's different experiences as well, and what Catalyst and Cardano may offer. Thank you. Simon, no pressure. <laughs> if you'd like to introduce yourself, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Simon, yes, uh, born in Germany, but living in Indonesia now. And uh, yeah, I've been here one or two times or three times maybe in these calls. And um, I am right now working on the proposal for fund seven or, or eight. Let's see how far we get. And uh, yeah, and um, yeah, so actually I, you know, I'm working on that proposal and, um, you know, may all, yeah, actually have a few questions also regarding that. And yeah, so I'm not sure if here is the best place to be or maybe in a different um, channel or maybe one-to-one -one with someone, yeah. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you have any questions, just ask. There's plenty of people here who are able to answer. Um, you're always in the right place in Catalyst. Um, I would love to hear from Charity if she's able to hear, if she's able to tell us, uh, introduce herself. Charity, are you there? I am. I'm, I'm in, I'm here. I can hear you. I can see you guys. Can you see it? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yes. yes. I can see you guys. Hi. Hi. Hello. How are you? We are very well. Thank you so much for being here, Charity. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Chaiti Mulindwa. I'm from the DRC, the Congo. And I'm glad to be in this meeting. I think it's a pleasure. It's something I've been looking forward to. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you for being here. Um, Aaron Craig, Kewa. No pressure. Uh, uh, <laughs> so it's so amazing to have such a different mix of Hello. people here. Keho, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Keho Yang. I'm the community manager of uh, Stake Boot Operator One. I'm from Taiwan, but I'm living in Buenos Aires. And yesterday we just hold a meeting, uh, a meetup like this. Uh, uh, for I'd like to know a little about the Catholic found in Asia. So this is uh, the time here is really very early. It's six a.m., but uh, I'm I'm really excited uh, to be here. Uh, uh, sharing this meetup with all of you, and we'd like to know what kind of uh, uh, proposal uh, or what kind of requirement can I uh, learn in this, this meetup. So I'm here. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit sleepy. Yes. Oh, no worries. Thank you for joining us at 6 a.m. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, this must be important to you. Um, thank you for yes, being here. Yes. Thank you. Um, one last chance for Aaron and Craig. If you don't want to, that's fine. And Craig doesn't have a mic. So uh, Aaron's probably, uh, if you're interested, Aaron, are you? Uh, I I spoke already. Oh, you spoke, you spoke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Your video. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay, so I'm hearing a lot of things. I'm hearing a lot of different backgrounds and um, a lot of different situations. Everyone is welcome. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for making the time. Um, my name. I haven't introduced myself yet. So my name is Angela uh, Gatenda and I am a coder and a member of the Catalyst community. I uh, had the opportunity to go through, through the Plutus Pioneer Program and I am now a member of the Atala Prism Program, uh, the Pioneer Program and I am very interested in being um, the Eastern African people to Cardano. And so that's what you're seeing here today. We have a whole collection, <laughs> an amazing collection of people. <laughs> people are not collected, that's the wrong word. <laughs> no, I was uh, just laughing at Jack. Right I was just laughing at Jack coming in because he's just sitting on the uh, Star Trek Enterprise there or something else like that. I was just laughing at his uh, background that he's chosen. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, yeah. Are you going to introduce Steve, yourself, Jack? And Jack. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, right. Um, I'm Jack. Hello. I'm a fellow Cardanian, fellow New Zealander, fellow human being. And I, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't really have much, of that, much else to say. We are joined by the O'Briens and we're grateful to have them here. <laughs> Robert O'Brien, in case you haven't noticed yet, uh, by the name the tag. Oh, so, yeah, the family affair. Uh, <laughs> it's great yes. to have everyone. Um, I was just introduced. That's my mission to bring the whole family. Yeah, everyone's welcome. Into everyone the is welcome. Um, I had a question. Does who, who here is a proposer? or is interested in proposing in fund seven. Wow, 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 wow. That's, that's actually most of us. <laughs> Who here is just a first timer and just here to learn more? Also. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if most of us are, are going to be taking part in proposals, we could all also just introduce our proposals and also just um, have an intro to what we're thinking. And if anyone has any questions about the proposal process or about um, the MAD website that is IdeaScale, <laughs> that could go well. Um, I can start. I have a proposal to bring together the people of Eastern Africa. Eastern Africa, I'm counting those as anyone either from or having experience in or willing to support the countries of um, Congo, uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, uh, Somalia, Kenya, Uganda, uh, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, um, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Zambia, um, Madagascar, and Mozambique. Um, and so I have an interest in putting uh, uh, together some sort of collection of those people. <laughs> I keep saying collection, it's the wrong word. <laughs> but assembly, assembly would be the word. Um, I would love to submit that proposal in the challenge growing um, community, the growing communities challenge. Um, does anyone else have a proposal they'd like to speak about? Yeah, I think I'd like to talk about mine. I have kind of doubled in a few challenges. Um, 
there's a miscellaneous challenge where I'm kind of thinking about how maybe we can um, uh, look at teachers, uh, maths teachers, mathematics teachers. I watched Angela trying to crack Plutus Haskell. And I thought to myself that if we do not strengthen mathematics from the ground and we do not strengthen computational and algorithmic thinking from the ground in children, we may struggle to find people who can code in these languages. So it's all very well for us to say that we can do all this work, but I don't know how we're going to build a force of people from the ground and thinking about the future of uh, coding and coders. Um, I have watched many people fail Microsoft uh, exams and I have worked a lot with just helping people to get uh, it around themselves to become good um, coders. So for me, I have an interest in mathematics for children in marginalized backgrounds, the teachers of mathematics to be trained to help children to code in Plutus and Haskell. Um, to learn the languages anyway. But, uh, the, so there's that one. Then I have a desire for girls and young women who will be digitally marginalized all the time because of different challenges, cultural practices, uh, hardship areas have their own hardships. And so working with a model school, so I was thinking about the one for grassroots roots and building Cardano from ground up, uh, the, the bottom up approach of reaching people who are unreached and then building it and exposing people to it. So um, in that challenge of uh, building community hubs, I've also sort of wanted to participate there and work with a model school. Um, I worked before with schools, about 60 schools in three counties, and I put about 450 computers in these schools. And so I would like to have a model hub in a hard to reach difficult area, um, looking at offline, online servers, what to do to, to get uh, people to think about blockchain, and in particular, the Cardano blockchain. So that's my sort of challenge that I've given myself. Um, let's see whether we can do something. I think if we have a little funding, we may be able to do quite a bit in these areas and make quite an impact. Yeah, is that a hand up? And quite a challenge it is. Yeah, Robert, Robert has to say what he wants to do. I'm okay. just really curious yeah. okay. to know. All right. Yeah, just really curious to know what um, challenges are faced by women in uh, East Africa in, in particular, and with respect to say, learning to code, learning mathematics. Right. We have a big challenge with education um, of numeracy and literacy, first of all, just starting at the bottom where we are building mathematical skills and building them to be. So girls don't choose maths easily. They go for, you know, more social, sciences so we want to encourage that we have very big challenges with dropout especially in the area where I am we have high enrollment rates into school but also mm -hmm. high dropout rates out of school so we have kids who don't finish school especially girls because of early marriages because of um, cultural practices this favoritism they prefer to educate boys over girls um, so we, we have, the girls have challenges. They just come in with some barriers into education. And so they struggle to complete education. And so somebody needs to kind of really handhold girls and young women to help them to finish. We have challenges also with like, um, um, the men's it's when they, they are having their period, they don't go to school. So we have a lot of projects around um, sanitary towels and things like that to build that confidence in a woman and a girl. So those are, those are challenges that we have with women and girls, that, especially in marginalized areas. And so digital divide affects them even further. They get further marginalized if they do not have any digital space to work in. So, so they really do need some support and some help. Joseph could add to it because I work with him. 
Um, Charity has things to say as well because she works with a lot of women. So let's just see what um, uh, some thoughts that come, come out. I've just invited them for the first time, so they may not have much to say now, but maybe we will think about it. But if they do, I welcome them to also add to what I'm saying. Thank you. That's cool. Yeah, I'd certainly like to know uh, more and, and seeing how whatever we do could really sort of help uh, women in general, um, both to come into the community, but overall, I'm acutely aware that in a lot of countries, women are, are very marginalised. Um, so it'd be good to see that sort of coming through more. Yeah, I, I just wanted to quickly thank you for sharing that perspective because it, it's a, it's a, you've raised some issues that I hadn't thought about before, even as a woman. And I've, I really appreciate the, the perspective. Yeah. Um, who else is um, proposing? Sorry, so, so, um, I, I, that was a fascinating uh, yeah, could, could I say something? Can I just, um, my first time here, yeah, so. I really don't know, but I, I can already feel that what people, what is being discussed here is so much in line with what I'm doing. And what I've been actually hoping for, I live in the DRC, and the DRC is, um, is, is a world by itself. It's, it's a whole different story from anything you'd ever think about. It's, it's, it's good, it's wild, it's, um, but it's untouched. Um, and the education system there is, is a system that is neither here nor there. It's not a system that you can pinpoint and say this is actually what we are hoping to produce once these children leave school. It, it's not named. Nobody knows what he's going to school to do or to attain. And you always get into school. In the DRC, you get into school, and there's a challenge. And the challenge is you don't know why you're going to school. You don't know what you want to be because there are no industries to work in, there are no jobs to go to, but you're going to school. And that for me, when I got there the first time, was really challenging for me because what that, the children go to school without a goal, without a name, and they leave school without having attained anything. And the only thing that they're thinking about is that after school at 16 or 17 or 18, my next goal is to get married. And the process of looking to get married, then they, get, they, 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 they probably get babies. And you find a 16-year-old has three, five, three to five children. And for me, that is terribly challenging um, in, in, in a world as we know it and as we are hoping to make it to be. And as I was talking to Shira, as I, was, I was talking to, to Shira and I was saying to her that um, Kenya, in, in Kenya, in East Africa, we have... Um, the issue of low enrollment may be or hydropower. In our place, there's low enrollment and hydropower, right? People are coming out of school at any point between the ages of 12 and 17. They drop out of school and they don't know where they're going. And um, what I'm working with now, uh, we've been giving distributing computers to schools, to women, at home who never got an education so that those laptops that they get, we can have programs in them that someone can sit in the house and have a way of getting into class in the evening, even if it's just recorded, so that they can challenge themselves and, and learn to read and write, learn about what is going on around them, and also realize that there's a whole world out there because the other challenge of, of living in the DRC is the lack of information. People don't know what is going on outside. Nobody tells you anything. You, you know nothing. People you, hearing about stuff like crypto is like I'm talking Greek to people. But uh, there is a whole world out there. People are interested. I have, um, we have, in our, in our, in our community, we have um, put together groups for young people to learn how to at least even just um, code. And I was looking for Shiro to come in so that she can assist us with those young people. There are women who can do a lot in terms of um, the education that they would get and the development that they would get in if we would have a whole 
a whole scope. Say, for example, we come in and um, we, we, we divide the country, we subdivide it on, on our maps, and we decide that in this area, we have these products. And these products are needed in this region. How do we uh, logistically uh, eliminate the lack in this region by bringing in these products into this place so that these people are running a living and these people are having what they don't have? So it's like we are solving a whole, a whole question in, 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 in just that one point. It's a logistical point. Um, the other thing is the road networks, the staff, and it's, I mean, it's a whole thing, it's a whole world. We have people, like my challenge has been how to bring, bridge this gap, because there is a whole gap there of, um, I think about 10 generations of people who have not gone to school. If, I, if you look at, at the country got independence, I think around 1963, 1961 or 1960. So all, all those generations, they are people who, who are half educated, half big for nothing. They don't know what they go to school to do. So if we got those people into a place where we can produce work for them, finance those projects, and make sure that the, that the projects are being financed right from the roots, the, the people themselves are touching on the money and they are touching on the on the on the on the, um, the, the formation they're being formed into into something and i believe then that um we would come up with at least a generation or a team or a group or a people that then would help lift the, the upcoming children into what we are looking to do now it um with, 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 with this challenge and with, with what Cardano is doing and with what um uh president is doing we can we, we would get these people inside i don't want to talk too much I'm, I'm i'm i just wanted to just say that thank you so much felix so i think charity thanks a lot already for the insights because here we directly see already what the community and also eastern town hall is about to create a huge collective human sensor array. Right now, we have to be honest, in the Catalyst community, mostly is every is quite, let's say, Western mind-driven. Most of the people in the Catalyst ecosystem are people from Europe, from the United States, around 30, 40 people. And we aim to build global solutions. What you are bringing on the table here, it's an extremely powerful insight because when you say, okay, we want to build global solutions, at very first, we have to be aware of local problems. And the thing is, in Europe and in the, in the United States, let's say we are kind of snobs in this regard. The problems you have are luxus problems. And the problems you are speaking about are problems that most of the people also in the ecosystem are not aware about. So what you're bringing here already is a huge value already to say, okay, which problems should be really addressed as well to really create Cardano as a global solution provider. In this regard, I think what you're bringing in here, what we create, because when I think about Project Catalyst, Project Catalyst is a problem-oriented solution-based platform to transform raw ideas into a real world impact, which means you are censoring a problem, you state a problem, and then you formulate a solution as a proposal. What you are bringing in here now requires a lot, let's say in this regard, a lot of proposals. It's about education, it's about onboarding, it's about coding, it's about a lot of stuff. The problem in the ecosystem now is that we have challenges. And the challenges we have right now, they are not really designed to successfully address proposals which you would need to submit in this regard. But there's a beautiful way to go. In Project Catalyst, you have two ways to co-design and co-create the environment in which we act. Once, you can submit proposals. Just let me share my screen for a second. Nice insight and definitely something where you really should come together and think about already. And I would love to see also collaboration with the Eastern Town Hall team in this regard. Let me share my screen for a second. When you speak about Project Catalyst, everything works on idea scale. Cardano.idea Cardano scale is the place where we submit our proposals. Then we have challenges. A challenge 
acts as its own category. You can define a challenge as a subfund. Each subfund states an individual problem. The community now is invited to address proposals to the stated problems represented in the challenge. It's a permissionless environment. You don't need any qualifications or titles to submit proposals. And the thing now is you can submit proposals in one of the challenges. Let's go to one, for example, just um, dip, 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 dex, depth and integration. When you go on the challenge, you will see at the very beginning already which total budget is available in the challenge. And when you scroll down, you can see the campaign brief where it's explained what the challenge is about. When you speak about challenges, the most of the challenges, and now it becomes really interesting for you, are submitted by the community and they are voted by the community as well. So in your regard, what you should do, you go on the main page, you scroll down and you see this challenge here. It's not the most visible, but I can guarantee you it's the most important one means fund eight challenge setting. This is the challenge where you submit challenges for the next funding round, which means you state a problem and you create your own challenge designed to the problems. You say here, for example, empowering young people, a young woman from Africa, education in East Africa and everything. These are, for example, problem statements which are not defined yet by the challenges we have for Fund 7. So what you can do is when you go on, this, uh, on the challenge, you see already we have a total available amount in US dollars of 12,800,000 US dollars available in Fund 8. What you should do is come together, co-design, co-work on a challenge, and then when you go on submitting a challenge, you can see there are some questions which are asked. Challenge title, the challenge question. You should provide a really short wrap up. Why is it important to submit this challenge? It's nice to define how success would look like, what the key metrics to measure are, and then an introduction, an open text about the challenge itself. Set this. Why submitting a challenge? Because with this, you open the ground for you to propose challenges in the next funding round. Which means you submit a challenge. When the challenge is voted and you say, for example, a challenge about educating African women, the impact of diversity, what not, name it whatever you want, but map already the problems you're just speaking about here map them into a challenge and provide their own environment for you to submit proposals already pre-designed to this challenge for the next funding round. Create their own space in which you can act and where you can provide effective solutions. Yeah, that would absolutely, <laughs> that would, that would fix so many problems. Charity, if you're willing to do that, I'm willing to work with you. Um, uh, and we can totally form collaborations between us um, and see what happens. I'd love to hear from Victor Malombe uh, because I know he works in education and I'd love to hear what he has to say. Thank you so much. I am Victor Malombe, I work in uh, Stradman University and um, I'm new to Cardano community. So today is my first meeting, and I, I just wanted to like uh, feel what you guys are doing and how I can we can support um, we can work in the community to advance the solutions in educations uh, by using technology. So I don't have much to say, but uh, yeah, I look forward to continue to collaboration and coming up with uh, the next solutions. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Does anyone else have a proposal that they're working on in Fund 7 in one of our current challenge settings? Uh, I think I'll share uh, my proposals. Uh, I have two proposals. Uh, one is, I think uh, Felix knows about uh, 
uh, an organization or a traditional organization in Ethiopia called EDDER, which is uh, like a community organization, a decentralized community organization. And um, my proposal was to be able to create tools to upgrade these organizations uh, to organize them as a DAO uh, globally, in fact, because these are a very small organization. They are very prevalent. Uh, about 90% of the population is members of one or two or more editors, but they are not scalable. But if we use the blockchain, then they can be scalable and they can also scale their services to the whole population. Um, these are very good. I have uh, uh, no time to explain entirely what the uh, editors look like, but that was one of the challenges. But uh, I was having problem where to put them. Uh, right now, they are. It's uh, the challenge is submitted to the DAO section, but it's not really. I couldn't find the right uh, uh, place to put them uh, in this challenge because it spans a lot of. Uh, a lot of really uh, kind of and uh, probably it's the answer or the solution for that or something for the next yeah and uh, the other proposal that i'm having is uh, in the lobby section uh, that's the reason is that as you know ethiopia was a kind of a, a flat project for carbon and in Ethiopia, but um, at least in my view as an Ethiopian, there were also setbacks. And the reason for that is that IOG is um, dealing with government and with the officials, with, with the officials, and it has to do that. But the problem with dealing with officials is that they actually know, in, especially in Africa, they have the, once they are in a position, they, are, they have no incentive to change, to change things. Um, so uh, I feel that there is a need, uh, always change come always from down up, at least in Ethiopia, governments have changed things, I think when there is pressure from down up. So uh, this challenge, this lobbying challenge will, uh, uh, for example, um, informed to the local media, to local people, uh, grassroots movements, and politician, local politicians who have local influence instead of in the, in the national level. But mostly these local polit politicians may have bigger uh, influence than the people who are sitting, for example, in the, at the ministry level, because they have support down uh, at the local level. So that's one of the challenges, a lobbying challenge. Um, these are the two challenges that uh, I have with friends in Ethiopia. Thank you for sharing. Um, if you don't mind, please leave a link to uh, your proposal below in the in the chat, and we'd love to follow and um, help, give any help we can and any support that we can, even if it's just a kudos. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll do that. All right. Anne has a question. Yeah, just, I don't know, I don't want you to go deep into it, but I'm curious to know what is an IDIR, sorry, just, just um, because I'm yeah. wondering whether it can go to the decentralized finance challenge, I don't know. Um, uh, well, IDIR is primarily, they are, um, you know, in, in, like enough in most African countries, when uh, loved ones dies, there is a lot of, uh, yeah, there is a lot of, a lot of change that's happening in a family. They will be in crisis, financial crisis, and psychological crisis. These are primarily organized. This organization, or these editors, are organized to help families with the grief process, and also to support financially, because the funeral process is is really very expensive. Uh, this is traditional thing, so no family can afford to to do that. So they have a kind of this risk sharing. Uh, uh, organization in it for a community organizing mainly in neighborhood organizations probably they can have about 200 300 members but if they become bigger then problems keeps in creeps in 
uh, uh, become centralized and probably corruptions comes comes in so they kind of split and they form new ones um the the they they have meetings every month they have uh, bylaws written bylaws they have ledgers so they are kind of modern organizations but very small very decentralized um, but they couldn't grow really much uh, because of the yeah uh, the tools they don't have the tools if they are centralized then the this corruption comes in so they they become they split and if they are small they can't really help the people that they are or they can't do anything or supposed to do the service they can give so they can't be less than a certain number and they can't grow more than a certain number i'm sure there are similar organizations there are there was studies made in ethiopia and also in other african countries that i have read there are also similar organizations in other african countries also yeah but, like for women with women there's a lot of they call them yeah. chama Yes, it's sort yes. of a risk management thing to support each other financially. Yes. Yeah. But what sets apart this uh, address is that they are they are non-discriminatory. Everybody, everyone. In fact, everyone has to be member. If you don't, if you are not member of Edder, then you would be a problem if you have a, if you have a tragedy tragedy in your family. So ninety percent of the population is members of Edder. Um, and they are also, as I say, they are kind of modern organizations. They have writ written rules, strict written rules. They have uh, non-paid kind of voluntary leadership, like we have in. Probably, it looks like probably like a catalyst. Um, so they are they are really kind of ideal for a blockchain implementation. Uh, if they have pre treasury, for example, I, I did system and um, also a governance system, a simple governance system, uh, identity and the treasury, then they can really grow globally. There is no reason why it, it shouldn't grow all over Africa. Uh, the, the, the model is really very, very, very nice model. I think Joe has a question for you. Kia ora. I've just um, arrived at the end of this. Nice to see everybody. Um, I, uh, I have a question for you. So it's something that we ask when we run um, our startup events and somebody's got something um, important that they want to get achieved. And from what I heard, even though I didn't hear the beginning of it, it sounds like what, you, um, what you're talking about is important to achieve. Um, so the question is, what do you need? What do you need from you know the people of Project Catalyst to um, to help you achieve what you need to, what you want to achieve? What help can we offer? Yeah, um, I think the main thing is to have the tools. What what Idris? I think when uh, we have to start from what Idris need. The Idris need the tools that is identity, the treasury, and the governance tools. Developing those tools is, uh, at the end, I think they, they can achieve or they can sustain themselves because uh, members collect their own, uh, their, uh, or there is a collection, or they, they, the fee will sustain them uh, later on. But at the beginning, they need those tools. What, uh, what I need is that it's really developing the, those tools or funding for the developers who are going to develop those tools. tools. Um, I'm not a coder. Are you um, looking for technical so, expertise? Yeah, technical expertise and some yeah, the theoretical probably uh, to study on these things. Uh, I'm sure it, this is not going to be a very small challenge. It's a big challenge. Um, there are different components to it. That's why it was uh, difficult for me to put at one place. I was looking at the DAO challenge and it is very specific only for, for developers or to develop tools, but not for implementation. And I was looking at the identity. This is not an identity challenge. So there are different components inside this, uh, this, this uh, uh, proposal. And uh, obviously people who has uh, expertise on those things, uh, they can really drop in, they can give their uh, ideas or what uh, can be done.
Oh shit, you record the room. Uh, Robert, I have to jump off. I, I make your host, okay? Yeah, okay. I think okay. I was recording that room, so I might have to go back in and start. <laughs> <laughs> it's a doctor, sorry. Um, so when you leave the, the meeting, you you are able to cancel the meeting as well. So you're host. Okay, okay. ready up. We'll do. See you later. And the and the people to actually build, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. It, it's good to make it clear. I'm 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 not a builder myself, so <laughs> um, yeah. Getting getting that message out there um, in your in your chat in your proposal is really really important. You know, this is this is who I need on my team. Yep. So is good it, um, is it a type of uh, insurance is what you kind of seem to be describing to me, fundamentally a type of community insurance, is that right? Uh, yes, uh, it, it is a kind of, in fact, there were, uh, there were many insurance companies who studied this address to actually to make them a kind of extension to, the, to, to their, their own uh, work, but uh, they are kind of insurance companies, they are risk sharing, uh, or risk sharing organizations, community risk sharing organizations. But the risk is a specific type of risk, basically. There are other types of risk that are added later in, in some editors, like, uh, for example, if uh, a farmer loses, for example, his oxen, which is the primary means of to till his land, then uh, some of the editors cover that, that cost. So they are kind of insurance funds. But uh, they are based mainly for funeral services. And uh, there is also what mm, sets them apart from insurances. Insurances only deal with money, but these, these organizations also deal with um, emotional crisis also for the families. They, it, it is mandatory to go and console the family, for example. As a member of the you go and console the family. You, uh, you have to be present at the funeral. All these things are there. But the service they are giving is much more than that. Uh, for example, as a uh, conflict resolution uh, system, for example, they have this, um, yeah, they have this, this capacity to do that, or they do that uh, without going to the government or without going to the legal system. They, they also do all those things. Right. Um, so they that... give a lot of services. Yeah, so there, there's a number of pieces in terms of what I've heard you describe um, before. Uh, so obviously there's the overarching um, idea that you've got, but within inside of that, if it's a, uh, you've got governance issues, which you brought up, you've got uh, dispute resolution issues, I take it, they operate um, as a fairly close net network of um, uh do they rely heavily on the social network to identify people in terms of what's going on and who's contributing what? Is that correct? Uh, um, the, the contribution is set. It's, it's a, a basic fee or everybody pays the same. Okay. Uh, there's no difference on country. Also, yeah. the payment is also the same. Uh, this is registered every month. There is a collection and everybody has to come. And if there are outstanding issues, they discuss and they decide. As it, as it, as it, uh, all the uh, so when when the collection occurs, do they come to you the same place? Is it operates yes. very much like Charma does as well, where people come in, and so there's very much the the turning up as a part of the social construction that builds trust yes. in the community, right? Yes. Um, and so uh, this is these are really really interesting uh, things though like there's something like what about a million charmers across Afri the african content isn't there there's a heck of a lot of them from a savings pool point of view um so what you're suggesting to me given that what Anne was talking about that it was a, a charmer and given what you're talking about um is that uh in a lot of cases there's a very specialized kind of community structure that deals with one particular or a small set of uh, economic interactions. In this case, you're talking about grief and the social structures that uh, come around it. 
So it's not just financial, as you've pointed out, it's the social stuff. And as far as I understand, but correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, charmers also operate very similar to that. But obviously, it's the paying back that works and keeps um, everything kind of in check. So it'd be really interesting to know how you think things like a blockchain actually can help in that space. How could something like uh, Cardano help in that? Because uh, in many respects, when we think about a blockchain, we think about it in terms of a global sense. And what we're talking about here is something that's uh, very local uh, and imbued with a lot of uh, interpersonal relationships and the trust, the rituals that go <coughs> around it. Um, and in some respects, technology could remove a lot of that social fabric. Uh, so I'm interested in uh, 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 thoughts on how, how that might operate. Yeah, uh, that's actually a very good question. Uh, I'll um, give my own example. For example, I left uh, Ethiopia uh, over 25 years ago, but I'm still a member of Edir, where I come from. Uh, it keeps me connected to the, to the community. There are about 2.5 million Ethiopians all over the world. I don't know if all of them are still members of their uh, elders in, in the country, but they are trying to, uh, many of are trying to set up elders all over the uh, world where they are. Um, the need to be connected really uh, is not, it doesn't really define only by locality. I mean, if, if you have that connection, you want to keep it wherever you are, whether you are there or not. And being there, for example, to console, uh, it's, it's a mandatory to console, for example, to go to uh, meetings or to, to console a family. But if you have, if you can't attend those things for some um, uh, good reason, then you, you don't have to attend them or you can't explain that you couldn't attend because of that. But if you really cheat, for example, you'll be, you'll be uh, uh, chastised or you could be fined for it. But this is part of it, not the whole of it. The most important thing is that the, the really the, the concrete, uh, how, how can I, the, the, the physical thing that binds together all of, uh, all of them is the money that collected and the, the payment that is made when the tragedy occurs. The other things are important because uh, but the money is also important, especially for the poor families. It's, uh, the, it's the most important thing. So having a globalized organization, in my view, it really uh, sinks the cost for them, for those poor families. So they, would, they wouldn't mind to join this organization, this decentralized organization, as a layer for them, as a base layer. And then they can have also the local leader on top of it, they are already it's a, the it's a already practice that to have two three to join two three editors because if they can afford it, people join two three editors. Those who can afford it. Yeah, there, there's so, an interesting pattern here that I'm just picking up, and I, I suspect this is a combination of things like tribal societies or collectivist societies, and um, the fact that there's a kind of uh, Dislocation, and so I'm Māori from New Zealand, so I'm part of the indigenous culture, the tribal society mm. collectivists. And one of the things that we confront uh, for our different Māori organisations and tribes is the fact that a lot of our people are going into cities, moving, you know, going away from what we call the whenua, the land where they've grown up or their relation, uh, their culture anchors them. And so one of the big concerns in terms of trying to preserve um, a cultural identity is how do you engage um, the rangatahi, which are the young people, or the people that have moved away from the land in the cities? How do you keep them connected? Uh, and that's actually an economic question as well, uh, because for a lot of Māori, uh, there's a lot of collectively owned land that has to be governed uh, in a collectivist way 
So, you know, um, communal sort of things, but also the value has to be redistributed back. Now, that uh, can be monetary value as well as the cultural value in other forms. Uh, and so it's the fact that you've got charmers and the idris, is that what you call them? Id Id idra? Id idra. 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 Um, mm. And I presume there's similar sort of structures, social structures around um, for uh, different areas. Yeah. Um, actually, there are about 10 uh, researchers found there are about 10 types of idras. As you said, there are, for example, ethnic based idras and religious based idras. But the most prevalent ones are, well, they are really non-denominational. They, they are area-based idras are the most common ones or mm. almost everyone joins. And I am very fond of these idras because they are non-discriminatory. They don't discriminate in uh, caste or identity or uh, religion or even economic uh, situation. Um, if people are um, known to are very poor and they couldn't pay, they don't throw them out. They keep them uh, inside. They, uh, they try to cover for those uh, people who have. So they, they are non-discriminatory completely, these area-based leaders are. But as you said, there are also uh, ethnic-based leaders. But I'm not very fond of them because there is also known to be, they get centralized and they, uh, it comes in, this corruption comes in and embezzlement comes in into these organizations and in, in, in this identity-based leaders becomes mostly, get, they get corrupted. That's what we find out. But this area-based leaders, especially in the cities, uh, uh, they are, they are multi-ethnic and there is no identity. They come purely to help each other. Members who right. live in one area, they come to help each other. So one of, the, yeah, one of the thoughts that I've got here with respect to what you're talking about, and indeed this came through um, like also with the Chalmers, is there's actually, and Angela's doing the um, Atala Prism Pioneers Program. Is that correct, Angela? Um, and uh, really um, there's probably a good use case to say, hey, we've got these different types of, community organizations, there's probably a really, really good case to make for what is referred to as a web of trust identity. Right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas most of the, the uh, Atala prism, the identity and the trust frameworks that have been talked about within what's referred to as self-sovereign identity are coming from the point of view of governments and large corporations, and they're coming down, right? Um, whereas, I think there's a huge case to be made, especially with things like Chalmers and Idris, yeah. um, for actually a tools to actually build, construct social identity through that really then starts to build on top of these existing governance structures. Um, because in effect, a big component of uh, self-sovereign identity is what's referred to as a trust framework or a governance framework, mm -hmm. i.e. a set of rules on how we actually operate. Right. Um, and in fact, that's the biggest challenge with most of this digital identity stuff. So there's a, probably a really, really good case here to mm. put up a, a proposal up into the Atala Prism one, even just to do some basic research around collecting information around how Chalmers and Idris actually manage identity, uh, just as a, a case putting forward. So uh, Angela, if you haven't already decided what your, uh, what your case is, You've just been handed one on a plate. <laughs> uh, so that's that's um, uh, one of the observations coming through. I think because of the problem that you're describing uh, is multi-layered and it's got lots of different components to it. Um, you know, uh, there's, for example, there's a project in Fund 6 that was funded to handle dispute resolution. Right, which is a big part of a lot of these sort of systems. So rather than having to build it, you could bolt into it. Mm. Uh, and there's probably a lot of co uh, cross pollination with the likes of Chalmers uh, and how we go about in constructing those sort of things. So uh, that's that's uh, uh, the things that were going through my head as I heard you talking. Yeah. Wow. Um... I have so many thoughts going on, going through my head. <laughs> Somebody else go. 
What What are you thinking? I, I'm just thinking that the, the easier concept is very resonant with a distributed autonomous organization and and also the concept of circles as well where you're working on different contexts uh, in different in different areas so one circle or one distributed solution can solve solve um, say burial issues whereas another one could could, could address uh, educational issues or and then all that work in an industry distributed way so the resources are reallocated all the time to where they need to go to um and then so i think Anne referred to kind of you know global networks and local solutions and then catalyst in this context could act as a kind of go global uh, repository of solutions and funding which then can recirculate into local solutions and let the, you know like distributed organization so there's a kind of it's very resonant that idea but not pronouncing it very well idris idris uh uh concept that's why it's, it's a very inspiring thing. yeah you have your hand up yeah i'm just thinking about charity um and some of the activities that are going on in uh, DRC with regard to women groups. So the Chama, we, I, I don't know whether people are understanding Robert when you say Chama, whether they understand what you're saying, but we do. Uh, we in East Africa and in Kenya in particular, we understand that because it is um, not necessarily, and I, and I agree what, with what Stephen is saying, that it is decentralized solutions with different focuses. So you can have focus of that social social support in a situation of vulnerability in the case of the loss of a loved one but it could also be um, business you know so many chamas chamas are these groups the the, the the little finance groups that mostly women form to support each other and so that decentralization and I know charity um, did quite a bit of development work and she's got a whole thing where she works with women in enterprise. So even Joe there with regard to enterprise, I've seen, Joe, I'm sorry, I've been meaning to talk to you, but I haven't gotten around to it, but I will. Um, so enterprise, so a lot of a lot of focus. So there's, there's a lot of activities that can go on at a local level, but have capacity, I think, to scale and become quite wide and and um, maybe not not so localized. They can go bigger if we think about them in a more collaborative way and more connected way. I don't know. You are making sense. Um, Martin, do you have a comment on Chamas? Um, I was actually thinking about how it really coincides with my idea as well. Um, I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, and uh, as I'm just sitting here, I'm thinking about how to improve my actual <laughs> uh, proposal. Um, if I could just mention what my issue is, uh, the, the problem I'm trying to fix here. Um, we've got a lot of issues in exporting um, of fruit. Um, and it really depends on lack of knowledge and information. This is how people make profit. Uh, so you go to a farmer who doesn't know uh, uh, what the price is right now uh, in regards to the market, in regards to the size of their fruit, and you've got corporations going there to determine the prices, and uh, you've got all these uh, all these methods of harvesting and handling that are creating so many losses along the way. Um, and by the time the fruit gets to the destination, um, maybe 60% um, is destroyed in the process. So this ends up, all of this ends up affecting the grower, which is the farmer. So, um, and the chamas are not enough. Um, so I was, I was hoping to give them power in some way using blockchain, but I still don't know how. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's my comment. 
Um, can you tease out that uh, what you see as being the actual um, some of the major sticking points within that supply chain side of things? Uh, where, where are the challenges when you said that the charmers isn't enough uh, and we've got this supply chain issue? What, what's, what's, what are some of the things that are causing the big problems? Well, most, most of the charmers in Kenya, in regards to farming, um, you'll find that in the meetings for the charmers, most people are trying to sell you fertilizers or new ways of, you know, growing or whatever. It's, it's, it doesn't deal with how to get power to be able to determine prices. Um, it doesn't deal with uh, knowledge of when to harvest exactly. Um, so like right now, I'll give you an example. Right now, the government has actually banned um, export of avocados. And I think they'll open up till, they'll open up in February when most of the fruit in the country is ready. The reason why this is happening is because you get, you get uh, brokers in the supply chain. They approach the farmers and they tell them, uh, this is the price and we'll take everything. And they're taking premature fruit, uh, fruit that doesn't have quite enough white matter. Uh, and, and you get these, these compounding issues from, from the handling. So for example, the, the handling methods are terrible. From how they pick from, and the, and the farmers don't know these things, right? They just want the money, right? So whatever you quote for them, um, they'll just do a bit of mental math in their head and then they'll say, okay, take it, right? Um, so what we're trying to, what, what I'm trying to fix here is that the farmer, number one, should know when their fruit can be harvested, um, when is the best time, when is the best time, there's a window, probably a week or two, when you can harvest avocados and get the most money for them. Uh, farmers don't have this information. Uh, their chamas also don't have this information. Uh, their chamas only just wait for either contributions or to sell more products. Um, if you've ever been to a chama meeting, it's quite frustrating <laughs> uh, because everyone's trying to sell you something, right? And at the end, it's all about the contributions. Uh, so at the end of the day, everyone just goes home frustrated. Uh, and this is a cycle that depends on farmers not knowing enough. Uh, chamas can be lifted to a point where Chamas themselves can be the exporters. They can be the processors. Uh, they can actually do everything. Uh, and, and brokers can also make their own money, you know, um, because the market is so huge. It's so, just that. Yeah. What, what you seem to be getting at is transitioning, in effect, Chamas into what we would call in New Zealand cooperatives uh, yes yeah uh, so moving to the end towards the the power of that sort of thing uh, and the yes. idea that there is what you're suggesting to me is that there's an idea for uh, an information platform that enables these charmers to effectively talk and cooperate with each other would that be yes uh, right through information uh, yes uh, I, have a, I have a question um how, what does the organizational structure looks like? Who who calls, for example, these meetings? Who organizes? Uh, there's different chamas in different uh, in different counties, for example, uh, and usually they they either have meetings or uh, how how are the meetings are called? Who who is calling them? Who is who is organizing the meetings? The chama heads. The chama heads would organize the meetings and some farmers would show up. They don't always show up, but they're expected to pay up. Mm -hmm. 
I, I'm, not, I'm not understanding who who are these are, are the individuals for example are they leadership they, or they they are kind of cooperative cooperative as robert is saying they're kind of cooperative movements in kenya we have like 12000 of them okay. um especially for farmers so in the farmer we have farmer cooperative movements that can become either more formal or less formal so it just depends i think is that right um, yes Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to understand in 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 connection with Edder. In Edder, we have a, an elected leadership to Edders. Do they this uh, this chairmen have elected or appointed leadership? That way, we can determine whether they are, for example, if they are decentralized organizations, if they are um, owned by the community or by the farmers, they are pretty much decentralized. So the blockchain can be. a good sort of blockchain mm. system can be a good solution but if they are centralized uh, what i found out uh, from the papers is about the indices uh, that this uh, robert was asking me if they are insurance insurance companies who tried to use these edders they couldn't do it because they couldn't extract value from these edders as a decentralized uh, organizations they they serve their 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 uh, their members if they are centralized then really there is a power up there who is served by these organizations so that can be a challenge i think decentralizing this uh, organize or these communities uh, making them uh, or the community to own this organization if the community owns them then i think uh blockchain based for them identity or uh, they can have exactly the same solution that uh, i was proposing uh, uh, so there is um quite a uh, let's see so when i was i sent the insurance it's it's that, that they act as a type of insurance um rather than necessarily being an insurance company um so there's definitely one of the benefits of using something like kadan is that we can actually lower the cost of um, distributing redistributing value right? um, so what we have a tendency is that like what you're bringing up about the the um, insurance companies trying to deal with uh, or work with is that they are trying to extract value um, yeah. that's fundamentally what they're trying to do to offer their services right to make a profit in some way both so that they can keep going offering the services but generally so they can also extract a certain amount of the value um, and what we can do with the underlying blockchain technology is obviously start to flatten that down so we can both uh, capture the value as it goes up and redistribute as it goes back right that that's the sort of promise of it it's known sometimes uh, more broadly as in the economics as transaction costs if we can lower the transaction costs to uh, search and negotiate with a, a wide group of people and it makes it easier to monitor and audit those things uh, then we effectively uh, uh, can become notionally more efficient but there's also another sort of broader idea that martin was sort of getting at is the role of information and knowledge within uh, supply chains and stuff like that and you can fundamentally look at anything as kind of an information processing system okay and so you start to look at where there are information asymmetries in what's going on uh, and because we can now do some pretty interesting things in a low cost way this is really kind of the role of smart contracts um, we can look at things in quite a different light uh, some things that just weren't possible become possible Right. Um, so the idea, for example, of each uh, community group, whether it's a charm or whether it's a tra or or whatever, um, small groups, whether they're called DAOs, can now have their own sort of uh, treasuries, and there's the promise that we can basically build up uh, rules that essentially allow us to redistribute value based on contributions or other bits of information uh, that's going around. Uh, so that's kind of where a, a lot of the stuff points towards. So in your case, Martin, where you're talking about the avocado farmer uh, not really having uh, much information, and therefore the middleman, the broker, and the uh, is 
playing really an information asymmetry role. They've got more information than the farmer, so therefore they can extract more information out uh, because it's hard for the farmer to keep on top of everything or to uh, get access to more detailed information. When you were talking, Martin, there's a, there's a really good economic study and stuff like that that was done in 2001, I think. It was to do with uh, Kalahara in, um, in India, the fishermen out there. And it was actually really, really a really interesting study that was done because at the time, the fishermen there suffered pretty much like your avocado farmers. Right? They uh, go out and fish, they get this fish, but they then had to make a bet on which port to go to to try and get the best price because they had no information. And they might turn up at a port and everyone else, all the other fishermen have gone there. Um, and so they had absolutely no choice to uh, but sell them for a low price. Right? What radically changed their life and the welfare of everyone involved in that was actually mobile phones cell towers started popping up along the coastline. And because it's the coastline, it would reach about 35 miles, 30 or so miles out to sea. So the fishermen, as soon as they got a good haul, could actually get on their phone, send text messages out and start uh, brokering with the local ports to find out whether or not um, where the best price was. And then they would go to that port, right? So the role of information in the hands of those at the coal face, so to speak, or you know, actually the fishermen or the avocado farmers, uh, can really liberate them in terms of what they're doing. Obviously, the difficult problem with a lot of this is how you get them to understand that information, how you get it to them. Because obviously those that are in the middle uh, don't want the information going out to the farmers. They don't necessarily want things to be more efficient because that means they lose their livelihood. Right? Um, so if you can find ways to route around the middle, uh, then you know, that's great. And this is actually one of the, some of the stuff that the underlying technology of Cardano supports us doing that. Right? Um, and there's quite a lot that we can do in that, both for insurance use cases uh, in what are referred to as supply, more broadly as supply chain related issues, um, so one of the proposals I put up on in Fund 2, um, which is to do with what's referred to as smart markets or, or sometimes referred to as combinatorial auctions. And they can be used in the supply chain route um, and actually have a, quite a nice property of um, uh, forcing uh, those that participate in a multi-legged um, route or um, uh, what we call a string along trade um, is uh, that um, you, the individual participants in each part of the route, if they start um, abusing their position, it becomes quite transparent and therefore they can no longer make or extract the value that they want to out of it. And it's these sort of things of new types of economic mechanisms and stuff, market mechanisms as they're referred to, that can basically uh, democratize effectively access to information. And therefore, because they're adding more information into the marketplace, lift everyone's welfare, which means everyone's well-being in that sense. But uh, Charity, you wanted to say something. Uh, let me just interrupt Go before on, Charity so. speaks. Robert, please, please, please put the fund two proposal if you have a link to it so that Martin can check that out. Thank you, Charity. Okay, um, I just wanted to probably just add just a thought that came to my mind about some of the experiences I've had in um, whether I should put on my camera. Should I put it on? But you can hear me. Huh? No pressure. So, yes, we can hear what? you. You can hear me. So some of the some of the things that um, a lot of the challenges that let me go back in history. A lot of the challenges that that, that came about is in, in in the way things were run before, and especially even when when previous uh, people were doing funding within Africa, they wanted to do funding um, from their own point of view. They did. They they want. They were coming like. They are coming to some people that don't have a certain way of life, a certain culture, 
a certain way of doing things and you're coming in to impose some of some stuff that 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 brought in confusion and having said that um not everything that was brought was bad but a lot of the stuff that that went wrong went wrong because stuff was introduced to people that had no previous education no previous leading in that particular area from whatever culture was coming in from outside and um, when this guy was asking about um, the, the middlemen and all that stuff, there's something I've seen within the DRC. And, and the thing that we do when we go into a community is we've tried as much as possible to find out um, how, how do you do things here? How do you, how, what, what do you need to do? What is the goal? What do you need to, to achieve when you're doing this? What are the challenges? What can we help you with? How do you think we can do this? Can we improve on what you have so that we then have the, the whole community in support of what we are doing and so that then we can get some of the, the community leaders to work with us so that then they can decide for themselves um, that this is how we want this project to go in as much as we want to, to, to lead, but we need to lead with them because it's their culture. They know how they deal with each other. They know how to, to, to solve. They have their own laid out a way of solving issues, solving, uh, resolving their own conflicts. They know how to do it. And um, the only thing that we're doing is, is, is going in there and introducing something that is going to help them then um, get onto the global map. They, they, are, they are local right now. But if we come in with Cardano, if we come in with uh, a, a, a prism or something, we are coming to bring this whole team on board with what they have. So we are able to have already ready leaders that can come on board. It's going to make it so much easier, so much more smoother for us to have to, uh, the onboarding because we, they already have their leaders. Um, let me give you an example of a community that I'm working with right now. They are right in the middle of... Um, the DRC in a place that has no electricity, a place that has no solar solar power, no roads. But it's it's, it's a mining village. It's a mining town. They have their houses. They have stuff going. So when we went there, we didn't go in there to in to to, to impose ourselves. We went in there and we suggested to them that um, the challenges that you're having in terms of power can be can be um, addressed. If if you if you would let us meet the local leaders. So when we met the local leaders, they said, yeah. We can actually work together. This is what we have been hoping to do, but we've never had someone asking us, how do we do things? We've never had someone asking us, do we have leaders? We've never had anyone asking us, who do you want to put on board? And, and the community supports them so that then the, the move, the, the onboarding is faster and smoother. Um, so when we sat with them last week, but one, we came up with a plan and the plan was that um, uh, we, we, we bring on board uh, people who would do um, a solar power plant. And the solar power plant is going to be magnificent. It's going to, to, to include, um, what do you call it? The cash power, cash power cards and cash power, whatever. You, you know about cash power when you put in, you, you, you buy what you need. It's like airtime. So when we brought in that project and we said, this is what we want for you, they said, exactly, that is what we want. Because if I have $8, I can buy my power for $8. If I have $1, I can buy my power for $1. And it's going to serve my house because this is what I've been looking to have in my house. So it's, it's nothing uniform. It's nothing that we bring in. It's, it's going with what they are thinking, growing with them and onboarding them as they are and developing what they have and, and then resolving and solving this whole issue of conflict and asking myself, how do I get these people here? No, they're already somewhere. They're already somewhere. They, but you know where you want them to go and, and they know where they want to go. So if you can marry that, let the community say, this is what I want. This is what we want. This is what we've been wanting to go. So the solar, the solar, the solar thing right now is actually on board is actually working and they've agreed with they've told us we have leaders and what they do we have agreed with them is that the cooperative that they're going to have is going to have their own leaders and they are they're, they're going to have every two months or every six months rotational uh, teams like if you lead for six months then another team comes on board and leads because everybody has an idea and everybody knows what, where they are and everybody knows what the community is looking for so our own challenge it has has been solved Actually, we just went in with an idea and they, they took it up. We married the ideas 
And we've come up with a brilliant idea. We are a brilliant project that has given birth to other small minor projects. That's just something I wanted to just um, add. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sharing, Charity. That's that's amazing. That's exactly exactly the spirit of the spirit of the community and the spirit of catalyst and the spirit of I don't necessarily know what to do. I don't necessarily know everything, but if I work with someone, if I ask someone, they know and they are able to help. And so that's the power of this uh, meetings exactly like this, because Martin can speak to Stephen, can speak to Robert, can speak to Anne, and Simon can say something to Tegene and Charity and Aaron. And so together we really are stronger. We really, really are stronger. Uh, Robert, yes. Um. Yeah, there was a couple of things that I just uh, forgot to mention. Joe um, mentioned about a platform when we were talking earlier, just as for those thinking about um, like the Chalmers and the Idris and stuff like that. Here's actually some really good analysis tools uh, for actually thinking about how you might actually go about designing um, the sort of interactions and stuff that could then be translated into um, uh, tools on the blockchain. Okay, so that's called the platform design toolkit that's going on. Um, the other thing too, I sort of wanted to loop a little bit back to um, Simon, um, because uh, Simon's interested in doing uh, an events-based platform for funds. What, are you aiming for fund seven, Simon, or are you aiming for fund, fund eight? Which one is it going to be? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm uh, right now write, writing the proposal for like maybe for fund seven and then let's see how you know how um yeah whether it's accepted or not and then otherwise for fund eight i think right. i think i would try fund seven you know it's it's definitely worthwhile putting it up on for fund seven you may not get fun also just first, for getting first feedback yeah. right for yeah. getting feedback yeah exactly that yeah. but what, what i was interested in here was that you were looking at doing a um sort of an event-based platform, is that, that, that's right, eh? to bring people in and that's what you're motivated by to, to try and fund events that might be in a town or a city or something else like that, yeah? Uh, those sort of things. And so what I was interested to know is you've heard some discussions going on here already about education, uh, you know, women, um, about the charmers, about Idras, um, uh, and I'm just, interested what sort of thoughts were coming if any thoughts were coming to mind in yes, terms of what yes, you're working on yes yes so the thoughts that came to my mind is because like i want to really create like an open platform right my initial um topics i'm interested in is education like bringing people together that want to share and teach and then want to learn and study uh, so that's kind of like the the vision for the project but it's really like open just wanting to bring people together um, that want to create something or learn and study together so um, I was thinking that my the project the name is favors could also be used for for exactly these um, kind of maybe the new challenges no, or the new um, mm, uh, or uh, wait, let me back up. So it's it's a it's a platform for events, but it's also like about um, kind of like crowd sourcing and crowd voting projects, like projects and events. So for example, if there's you know different projects in Eastern Africa, for example, that want to uh, or people that want to meet locally um, to discuss discuss certain issues, be it like the farmers. Um, you know, uh, about, you know, the crops harvesting issue or be it, you know, um, young women about like education or awareness building and so on. So all of these things could be, um, or the, uh, the vision is actually that these things can be held on that open platform so that anyone who has an idea to, and says, you know, this is an important thing we need to do, uh, can initiate like this, this pro, an, a project or an event, and then others can join in, um, you know, kind of by voting or being part of this idea or movement. And then if there's enough kind of interest or demand for a certain, you know, pro, I, let's, I, I, I call it idea, 
could, could be like a project or an event, then, you know, then, you know, the, the community itself of that idea can then, you know, go the next step, be it like, you know, set up a meeting or, you know, in person or online, or be it, you know, gather resources or define resources that need to come together for this event or project to happen. Um, yeah, so, and, and, you know, when I, when I hear myself talking about it, you know, I know it's, it may be a little bit complex, you know, the different elements being involved in that, you know, I find it like a little bit challenging. I've been actually working on this for a while and, um, and different people have been suggesting different approaches actually on how to do these things, you know, like sequential, you know, first like the idea and then the voting and then the crowdsourcing and the funding and so on. Um, and I'm not sure what the best way is, but, you know, my idea is to kind of um, find out and, you know, research or tr do some trials or experiments, you know, of different ways of, uh, of you know, how this platform could uh, be done in the most effective ways. So actually the idea right now is uh, to, to get the funding for kind of creating a framework. I, this is what I discussed. This is the idea of like a, also one developer who has been creating the prototype for this uh, suggested to, to create the framework for um, uh, a, a framework which allows different pilots or experiments to happen on this platform to find out which are the most effective ways on actually how to do this because it doesn't exist yet right so there's no model for it so you know whether yeah i don't know if it makes sense please <laughs> maybe i'll stop here oh hi joe i i tried to contact you actually also but i i i, I couldn't i couldn't con i couldn't send you a message on idea scale somehow i don't know uh why but yeah. Idea scale is a whole journey. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got I got some issues. I tried different things, but so up, you know, up, but please like maybe I'll stop up, here and, and, and let someone like you know paraphrase or give feedback or any or, please or put your details or below. Um whether you'd yeah. like to share with yeah. everyone or you'd like to speak directly with Joe, um, put one way that she can definitely reach you all the time. Um, let me just mention before I, I go to Charity's raised hand, Joe's raised hand and Tegan's raised hand, um, that this evening or today, later or tomorrow, if you're in New Zealand, we are having a community event. Um, and that's the link where if you are a, a proposer in front seven, you can come and just practice, practice, practice putting your idea out there. Um, please feel free to sign up. Feel free to register for Challenge Fest. It will be at, what's the time? 1700 UTC on Zoom at the link below. And the point is to come and see um, which challenge you are interested in proposing in. And you can join the breakout room for that challenge and see if, your proposal would be a good space for that challenge. And if it's not, the team will let you know and they will tell you which challenge would be better for you. Um, so please uh, join us this evening where I am <laughs> later on today at whatever time if you are living in New Zealand <laughs> or Australia. Um, and we have 15 minutes left. If anyone would like to give any uh, final closing points, um, go right ahead, Joe. Kia ora. <laughs> um, as I've been listening to you, so uh, I've been I've been thinking about um, how uh, I might help, how we might help, and also how you might be able to help us in return. Like it's um, trying to find a win-win here. Um, so the idea is um, so. I was funded in Fund 6, uh, which was great to build um, or create a Cardano canvas. Now, I don't know whether you know what a, what a canvas is, um, whether you've heard of a lean canvas um, or um, Robert mentioned before the platform canvas. What, what they are, are um, really briefly, a um, 
a, a canvas, a piece of paper. <laughs> um, and um, they have frameworks on them for um, being able to articulate the various different pieces of the puzzle that you're trying to put together, whether it's a cooperative, uh, whether it's a supply chain, whether it's a, um, you know, a specific product you want to get into a, into a group of people. Um, and uh, those canvases sometimes help with um, the articulation of the messy stuff, <laughs> which I heard, um, heard you mention before. Um, it makes it easier rather than, rather than um, talking the problem because you're able to, you know, follow your ideas through in your brain, but it doesn't necessarily mean the person listening to you can follow. But these canvases allow you to actually write down and show in a really visual format all of the pieces of the of the daisy chain you're putting together to create value for a group of people. It also means that the canvases can show who gets the value and where the value can be distributed. And that makes it really much, much easier for um, for developers and programmers and, and um, people building things like like the things that, that Rob builds. Um, it makes them it easy for them to understand the use case and understand how that technology can be applied really specifically to the model that you're talking about. So um, in order for me to fulfill my challenge, what's a really good thing to do is to be able to start using um, some of these canvases with people like yourselves to explain how to use them so that you can articulate your your ideas and then it's much easier to build um, to build proposals on top of that for which piece you want to build first because you can see it all laid out in front of you I wish I had an example with these so that I could hold it up and, and show you um, but I'm thinking if I put my details into um, into the chat um, and you'd like to get together to just look at maybe um, a platform canvas, which which is um, is actually a number of pieces of paper, and explain how to use them. What that might do is a help me work out what's missing from some of the canvases that have gone before that need to be put in, but also it might help you guys articulate your. Um, your projects better because you'll be able to see them in front of you. All you need is some post-it notes and I'd send you some a, a link to something or maybe we could do it on a Miro board. But anyway, what I'm doing is offering a workshop to use a canvas to make it easier for you to articulate your ideas of, of what it is you would like to build on, on Cardano's technology for your community. So if there's anybody that wants to take part, I'll put my um, put my details in the chat um, and please uh, reach out to me and um, we'll organize a, um, a bit of a, a bit of a workshop around a canvas. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, that, that's an offer. It would help me and I think maybe we'll help you guys as well articulate your challenges. That's that's an offer. <laughs> <laughs> we thank you for your offer and we will respond. Just put your details below and everyone will go reach out to Joe if you need the help that she's offering, right? Okay, take in. Um, I ahead. just want to, uh, I just wanted to say to Marty uh, something that helped me to to kind of sort out uh, the organizations uh, that um, that really we are we are trying to deal with that I, I i i found out myself that there are three types of organizations uh, one is serving profit like private organizations the other serving power and the third one is serving the users or its members and cardano is trying to serve the users or to bring uh, the power to the users so uh, the problem comes when those two that that the, those serving the profit and there is no nothing wrong with serving profit or power, but when they masquerade as serving the user, 
that's when the problem comes. That's when the corruption comes. So I think it's important to find out or not to, yeah, uh, not to uh, make a mistake of doing that and find out and try to bring the power to the users or to organize or, or organizations to make them to serve the user instead of the power. Or as you said, the, the problem was that um, there were uh, middlemen who served themselves as this, these are profit organizations. And there are pro probably politicians who are trying to use this organization. So I think for you, the best thing is to look at it and probably to organize this organization so that they can use the users or to organize them so that they can serve the users. Then you can really bring the tools that we are talking about and strengthen these organizations. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Cool. I hear you. There's like so many thoughts going through my head right now. <laughs> I love this meeting. Um, this has been the Eastern Town Hall, uh, the English room. Uh, we meet again in two weeks and that will be on Saturday, the 4th of, of December um, at the same link where you registered today. If you would like to just hang around until 2 p.m. or you know the hour, <laughs> whichever hour it is, it's 2 p.m. for me. Um, feel free. If anyone would like to make any final comments, like Robert, please feel free. Um, I've been Angela Gatan. <laughs> Thanks for having me as your host. Uh, go ahead, Robert. Thank you for being the host. Uh, well done. Thank you very much. I did have one burning question for you, though, Angela. One burning question. I was intrigued um, by the Atala Prism Pioneer Program that we're on, which is to bring the identity stuff that we're coming through. I was very, very delighted to see that there's a huge, big, or a lot of reference or a lot of emphasis being placed on Christopher Alexander and patterns. And I was curious as if you'd ever come across his work before. I actually hadn't until I read this and it's been crazy. Um, so many thoughts, <laughs> Robert. That's a whole other two hour discussion. I will speak to you about that. Uh, would anyone like a closing thought on anything you mentioned earlier today? But I might just give a little bit of context for people that uh, the reference to Christopher Alexander, he is a, or is, yeah, she's still alive, uh, an architect. And obviously Angela has trained as an architect as well. So I was curious whether she'd actually come across his work because his work has focused on the idea of uh, complex, um, how do you distribute knowledge uh, in a form such that it's generative. Okay, so the idea of generative knowledge here is the idea that um, we can lay down patterns and other forms or set of principles in which the knowledge can be reused to give people back the power or the ability to understand what they need to do and how to do it. Yeah, it's just, and so a common uses uh, pattern languages. And so a lot of what Joe's talking about just before in terms of the platform, uh, in terms of canvases, is actually a type of pattern language, a way to distribute and communicate knowledge really, really effectively. And a lot of that work actually originates in the work of Christopher Alexander as an architect. So here's a little observation for you. <laughs> But otherwise, thank you very much, Angel. And um, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for being so open with your ideas. And uh, we will do our best to support you. And, uh, you know, this is a community. It's exactly like that. Um, we all have each other's backs in as far as we can. Um, and we will give whichever support that we are able to give. Um, so, I'm done. <laughs> I've said everything I had to say, and I hope you have. Does anyone have a closing comment? 
I will just thank you so much for being here. Thank you for giving two hours of your day. Um, that's about it for me. You said you were uh, already we... two hours. Thank you for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's let's <laughs> thank you, Angela, for hosting. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank said, you. Lovely to great job. Lovely to meet you all. It's really, really pleasant to to come across oh. new faces and familiar faces as well. So thank you very much for turning up. I think it's a great community. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye bye. Let's see you later. Bye bye, guys. Take care, Robert. See you Monday.